Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event, a discussion on post-pandemic labor economy in Silicon Valley in Italy. My name is Alberto Saleo. I'm a co-chair of the Bay Area chapter of ISNAF, the Italian Scientists and Scholars in North America Foundation. Our goal is to connect, empower, and celebrate Italian scientists and scholars, and in our case, with a particular focus on the Bay Area. The way we connect scientists is through events such as this one, uh, Pre-pandemic, we had in-person events such as our Bay Area Back Talks, where we would go to either Berkeley or Palo Alto, and hopefully we're going to add a third location in San Francisco, where we would have short lightning, lightning talks and then pizza and drinks to get to know each other. Um, other things that we're interested in doing is uh, uh, organizing exchanges of students between Italian universities and academic centers in the Bay Area, and also connecting uh, industry um, to academia uh, in a little tighter way. We're a not-for-profit organization. We're always looking for volunteers. So if you're interested in getting involved, please uh, contact us. You can go on the website, uh, isnaf.org. Tonight's event is organized with the support and sponsorship of Comites. And so without further ado, I will introduce um, Silvia Veronese of Comites. Grazie Alberto, thank you Alberto. Um, thank you for joining tonight. Uh, the number, I'm watching the number on the Zoom screen is, um, is going up, it's great. Uh, my name is Silvia Veronese. I am a member of Comites of San Francisco. Comites stands for Comitato Italiano Residenti Estero, Committee of Italian Abroad. We're a body of uh, 12 volunteer members, uh, Italian nationals, uh, and we are elected by Italians residing in the area approximately every five years. Um, our goal is to represent and support the needs of the Italian citizens abroad. Uh, the Comites of San Francisco, which cover the same jurisdiction of the consulate, namely um, the West Coast from Alaska to Northern California, approximately Utah to the Pacific Island, works in collaboration with uh, the consular authorities, the Italian uh, regional government, uh, and uh, the many local organizations uh, really promoting the, in the interest of the Italian community. We organize uh, social and cultural events, and we offer assistance in, ma in you know, many different areas from schooling, training, entertainment, uh, business, uh, and also spare time. Um, the Comites of San Francisco specifically is organized uh, in uh, different working areas. We have a very active uh, Commissione per la Lingua e Cultura, Commission for Language and Culture. Um, they have led some very successful initiatives to support and expand the Italian language in the schools. We currently offer support for teachers and students who are taking um, AP Italian. We offer small grants as well for those who are successful. Uh, we hold an annual conference called Every Child, which focuses on education strategy and support for all young students during the early development and early childhood um, uh, years. Recently, in the last couple of years, we have uh, launched a very successful project called Rete Rosa, which has, uh, is led by Elisabetta Ghisini, with, which brings together female professionals of the Bay Area. It has received a lot of, uh, um, it's been very successful, and uh, please do go and visit their website. Um, Rete Rosa, it's under, it's under comites, uh, sfcomites.org. Uh, we have also created in the last uh, few years a very successful documentary, Italians by the Bay, which has been broadcasted by many networks across the US uh, and Italy. We have also published a book, La Valle, La Valle del Silicio, a collection of stories and interviews of Italians in the Silicon Valley from the early days of Olivetti to today. Um, as a chair of the Commission for, uh, of University and Research of Comites, it's my pleasure to uh, sponsor and spearhead uh, this first joint event with ISNAF. 
Uh, tonight's topic, as Alberto mentioned, is labor economy in, with particular focus uh, for, um, in Italy and the Silicon Valley. We have a panel, excellent panel, panel of industry experts uh, who will lead the discussion. Um, I hope you will you know, enjoy the next uh, one hour or so. And now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Lorenzo Ortona. Uh, the Italian, Italian General Council of San Francisco. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Silvia, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, it is actually my pleasure uh, to be able to be with all of you today. Um, the, in my years here in San Francisco, I have tried as much as possible uh, to have Italian associations in the Bay Area collaborate, uh, bring the uh, forces together um, and, and create network um, uh, on, on many, many issues. So tonight, of course, is a, is a special uh, evening for me because it's a collaboration between uh, ISNAF uh, Bay Area chapter um, that uh, I, I was very proud uh, to, to support in its, uh, in its birth and growth in 2017. And of course, Comites, uh, which is our counterpart uh, as, as Italian Consulate General. Um, definitely the title is, is very interesting. I, I will listen uh, with a lot of, uh, of interest and attention. The post-pandemic labor economy in Silicon Valley in Italy um, is, uh, is interesting. Uh, first of all, because uh, Silicon Valley always uh, gives messages to the rest of the world uh, beforehand. Uh, and of course, Italy in many ways um, does the same for other aspects. Uh, so it will be interesting to, to listen. The panel is uh, uh, of, made of old friends. Uh, I've known them all these years, uh, starting with Enrico Moretti, the keynote speaker, uh, that uh, I was very fortunate to be a friend of in these years and always... Uh, gave me a lot of special insights on, on, the, on labor in general, and so I'm interested in post-pandemic. It is a big question, um, how the world will look like, uh, what kind of jobs there will be, how our day-to-day -day life will change, uh, will entrepreneurs be interested in finding new solutions, and what sectors will really be affected by this revolution um, and, and this, this terrible period that we're finally coming out of. Uh, so I think it's, it's definitely very interesting uh, not only for, for the Bay Area, but I think uh, uh, in Italy and elsewhere uh, to listen to, to the debate. Uh, very interesting, uh, every panelist for the sector they represent. Uh, I will leave, of course, to Luigi Baietti of Lombard Street, the description of them, but uh, uh, I want to say that I'm very impressed by the panel of tonight, uh, and I'm sure that each and every one will, will have a story um, that, that we can take home and, and think about. This is obviously an open-ended discussion of tonight. I don't think there will be answers. Uh, we're just starting the post-pandemic period, uh, but it's very interesting to start to talk about it now and today. Um, and allow me before I end and leave the word, uh, because uh, the, we all want to listen to the debate. Allow me just to say that tonight is, a, is an important uh, night day as well, because um, our, our government has just announced uh, the opening of the Innovation and uh, uh, Cultural Center in, um, in San Francisco. Um, this will be uh, a project that uh, uh, we will uh, discuss and talk about in the months to come, but uh, it's been uh, um, the fruit of many years of, of work. Uh, so I'm very happy that uh, precisely today, um, in order to as well be present in this part of the world, and in this particularly interesting times, um, the Italian government has decided to have um, a place where Italians can meet and interact in this part of the world. So thank you again. I leave the word to Luigi and uh, I'm very curious to, to listen to all of you. Thank you. Okay, first of all, thank you to the Consul General of Italy in San Francisco, Lorenzo Ortona for the introduction. I will now just want to make you a quick overview of what we are going to go through today. So we will, uh, we are going to discuss uh, uh, the effect of the pandemic on the economy and uh, on the geography of work in Silicon Valley and its relationship with Italy. We know that Italy has always been an important source of engineers and scientists that have contributed to the technology revolution here in Silicon Valley. And also when Silicon Valley based company, I had a remote team in Italy, 
the physical presence has always remained necessary. So we will try to understand what will happen in the next years after the pandemic and the change it has forced in the paradigm of works, what will be and what can be an opportunities for Italy. So to start with this, we will have a keynote from Enrico Moretti, that is uh, the Michael PV and the Donald Weyer Professor of Economics at the University of uh, California, Berkeley. And uh, after that, we will have a Q&A with uh, our panelists. We have Maddalena Adorno, that is the co-founder and CEO of Dorian Therapeutics. We have Giovanni Colella, co-founder, chairman, and co-CEO of UDA Health. Fabrizio Capobianco, chief innovation officer of Minerva Networks, and Marco Zappacosta, co-founder and CEO of Thumbtack. Uh, during all the event, please feel free to use the Q&A in Zoom to put your questions, and we will answer on every question during the event or at the end of the event when we have the, the Q&A. So to start the event, I would like to introduce uh, Enrico Moretti for his keynote speech. And as I told you before, Enrico is the Michael Peavy and Donald Weil Professor of Economics at the University of Berkeley. He wrote the book, The New Geography of Jobs. And the book was described by Barack Obama. And I quote, a timely and smart discussion of how different cities and regions have made a change in economy work for them and how policymakers can learn from that. So I want to enjoy. Okay, Enrico, please. The word is for you. Thank you. Thank you, Luigi, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, Lorenzo. Uh, and congratulations, especially to Lorenzo, for uh, having succeeded in opening the Innovation Center. Uh, Lorenzo has been a, a, a powerful force in the Italian community for the past four years, and uh, I'm going to be very sorry to see him leave uh, next month. He will be very missed. Um, um, I would like to discuss with you uh, some, uh, to share with you some thoughts on uh, the effect of COVID on uh, the workplace and the future of uh, San Francisco and Silicon Valley. Uh, the, the last 15 months have been, uh, have seen arguably the most sudden and profound change in the way we work in modern history. Um, if you go back to February, 2020, uh, it feels uh, a life ago, uh, but back then, very few people were working from home. The share, the typical share of work from home in the US was, uh, uh, was 2%. 2% of jobs were under percent work from home. Then COVID hit in March, 2020. And uh, within a couple of weeks, suddenly offices and factories were very quickly rearranged uh, with a speed that, that really surprised me. Uh, and it was, uh, I was, Pretty surprised by the speed that Italian firms adjusted. Uh, it was almost as fast as the speed that uh, American firms adjusted. Uh, within a couple of weeks, uh, most office workers were uh, working remotely from home. Currently, the share of work from home in San Francisco and New York is about 85% of, of office workers. So essentially, the vast majority of us are, are still on Zoom. And one important consequence has been the possibility of uh, separating the place of work and the place of residence. So the, the fact that we're working on Zoom has allowed a lot of people to leave very far from uh, where they work. And it's also allowed some firms to hire workers very far from their uh, physical office. One effect has been that expensive cities like San Francisco, New York, um, and when I say San Francisco, it's really San Francisco and the rest of Silicon Valley, has seen an outflow of residents um, with people essentially moving to a cheaper location. Most importantly, new entries having slowed down a lot. So, so the typical city in any given moment sees new entry and exit 
Um, what has really slowed down for places like San Francisco and Silicon Valley is new entries. People who have a new job uh, or, or, or planning to move here uh, have delayed uh, moving here. And, see, and this has resulted in uh, fewer residents. Uh, and, uh, and this has raised important questions on the future of successful and expensive cities, right? like where we live. The prevailing narrative in the media describe this shift uh, as a permanent shift with uh, a larger and larger number of workers working from home and deserting this, uh, the, this star cities, the cities that uh, over the past 10, 20, 15 years have grown the most. Um, if you read the New York Times or the Washington Post, that's, that's in, in essence the, the picture that emerges. One where the downtowns are doomed, there are empty office spaces, uh, empty stores, empty restaurants, and the tumbleweed rolls uh, in a deserted street. Um, and the question uh, is obviously linked. The question of the future of uh, star cities, expensive cities like San Francisco and New York, uh, is clearly related to the question of the future of the workplace. Uh, are, are we enter a phase in which the new workplace is uh, more and more remote, uh, where office space is, uh, is becomes very limited and most people work remotely. People don't have to commute and uh, have we enter a new, a new normal? Uh, that, that's, that's the, 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 the fundamental questions, both for the future of some firms, but also the future of the communities uh, where, where we live. I am personally uh, skeptical of the prevailing narrative that you see in the media, uh, one where there is essentially no cost in working from home, only benefits. Um, <clears throat> I think that everything that we know about the economic reasons uh, that brings that so far, that the, before COVID have brought firms and workers to thrive in places like Silicon Valley, San Francisco, New York, suggest that uh, especially in the innovation sector, creativity and productivity cannot be sustained in the long run when workers are scattered uh, and are far from colleagues and are far from clients. There, of course, there are exceptions to this rule and we're gonna hear about some different experiences today in the panel. Um, so I don't wanna, I don't mean that there is no possibility of, of, uh, of, of, of embracing a model of mostly work from home uh, workforce. But if we're thinking about the average firm or the medium firm, if I think about the typical experience going forward, my expectation is that the new normal after COVID in the long run uh, will not be all that different from the old normal before COVID. And I want to stress the term long run. I'm not talking about now, uh, obviously, uh, because we're still not, uh, we're still vaccinating. We're still not 100%, not everyone is 100% safe. And I'm not even talking about the fall. I'm talking about 2022 and onward after the, 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 the feeling, the, after the, the health, health crisis is hopefully over and after we feel uh, safe around each other again. Um, the, what happened in terms of productivity and, uh, uh, and measurable outcomes uh, during, during COVID? Uh, I've been working on this uh, for a while and what you saw in the first six months after uh, COVID hit, so from March to the early fall, uh, or to the mid-fall of 2020, what you saw are two things. First of all, and most surprisingly to me at least, that in the short run, productivity was unaffected. A lot of firms reported not a big difference in, in worker productivity. And the time spent at work increased significantly. Uh, the average, the, the estimate, the, the best estimate for the average increase was about uh, 45 minutes of extra, of extra work. Essentially, what happened in the, at, at the beginning of COVID was that uh, workers who were working from home and were not commuting spent a significant part of the time they would be spending commuting. They spent it uh, by uh, adding, uh, adding more time 
to their to their work day. Um, they the the general uh, morale uh, of people, you know, COVID crisis aside, but the general workplace morale was not uh, negatively affected, uh, and, and projects were being completed. Uh, on average, I'm, I'm talking about means here. So we're being generally completed on time, if at all there were even if there were even some productivity gains. However, the picture started changing in the longer run, uh, uh, and when with with uh, measurable productivity declines. Again, I'm talking about the mean here, the, the average the average experience, and most importantly, measurable decline in the innovation. Uh, and the generation of new ideas, new projects. Um, there's been a decline in the cohesion of, of, of workers um, and serious issues with the hiring, uh, with the new hires, the, 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 with the onboarding of, of, new, of, of new members of teams. Uh, like the short run effect is of course, is, is, is an effect that, re that reflects the, the, the completion of project that existed uh, most people were already knew each other. Uh, uh, it was just a matter of, of um, um, you know, finishing existing ideas and existing projects. The clients were the one that were, were already new. But over time, uh, what happened was that the, 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 there was uh, uh, an, a noticeable decline uh, in, in the ability of workers to perform at, 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 at their best. This was particularly true in the most innovative sectors uh, of, of, of the workforce. Now, this is only, you know, what I call the long, long run here has been only like a few months, so you know, 50 months altogether. So it, only time will tell if um, this productivity declines will, will, remain, uh, will, will remain there. Um, and I think we will need, uh, you know, probably in one year, we could have actual hard data to answer th these questions. But I think that um, the, 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 everything that we know on what drives productivity and creativity uh, inside the firm, especially inside innovative firms, suggests that um, it's hard to sustain, uh, to, to remain productive and creative when, no, everybody's scattered around the world and everybody's far from, from clients and, and co-workers. One thing that I think is, confirms that is that the technology for communicating with each other uh, is not so new. That you know, Zoom might be marginally better than Skype or might be even substantially better than Skype, but we've been, we had this option of communicating with Skype uh, for 25 years now. <laughs> uh, and the same prediction of the decline of Silicon Valley and the, and the scattering on the workforce um, that the media are uh, bringing up uh, in this past year, exactly the same uh, language and the same prediction. Uh, you saw them in, in, the, in the late 90s when internet uh, appeared and when people started uh, using, uh, using Skype uh, on, on on, on more, you know, more frequently. Uh, the, the, the most influential book of the time uh, is probably Thomas Friedman and it's titled The World is Flat. And the key premise was indeed that uh, because of internet, we didn't need to be in Palo Alto. We didn't need to be in San Francisco. We didn't need to be near each other. We could live in the Tibetan desert and, at the same, and remain productive and creative at the same it, it, as if we were in downtown Palo Alto or in, or, in, or in downtown San Francisco. And it was predicting, just like many commentators at the time in the late 90s, they, they were predicting the disappearance of Silicon Valley, the disappearance of this expensive innovation cluster that, 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 uh, that, um, that offered an agglomeration of, of talent and of firms, but it were also very expensive. So he was saying, just like many were saying at the time, the internet will result in a delocalization, complete delocalization of innovative firms and, and workers. Now, if you look at the data, in the period between when he wrote the book between the late nineties and now, there was actually an increase in concentration of the innovative sector, whether you measure uh, workers, so where, where the workers are, whether you measure uh, R&D investment, whether you measure 
uh, venture capital investment. Uh, they're actually and they're actually today more concentrated than than when the internet appeared. So this is not something that this technology is not completely new. Certainly, we're more used to it after a year of, of, of a, this is a completely new social experiment that has that has really uh, uh, profoundly altered our, our existences. But um, you know, the, the same prediction were made 25 years ago and were proven uh, not true. I've been doing some work on a data set that tries to measure these trends in real time. Uh, Again, as, as I said, we, only time will, 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 we need more time to have definitive answer, but let me tell you what I find so far. Um, I have a new data set that has all the job openings uh, in the US in real time. Uh, so every time there is a job opening, I can, I can see in the data and has a, a degree of detail and speed that is much better than the, the data set that, that you, that the data that you read of when the BLS announces uh, job creation and unemployment every month. Okay, so you have this monthly announcement by the government data, but those are backward looking. I, I, I have a data set that, that comes from, uh, from a, a data vendors that assembles all the online job postings in the US. And it, it's incredibly timely. In fact, I can see job openings up to uh, an hour ago and it, it is incredibly detailed. And so I've been looking at how job openings, so these are new jobs that are being created. Uh, what happens to the type of job openings in uh, most met U.S. metro areas, and uh, <clears throat> what happens in the in the work from home uh, uh, in, in, in the jobs that are only work from home? And I see two things that are clear. Um, whether we look at Silicon Valley or at the other expensive cities, the recovery is well underway and it's is accelerating. Uh, in terms of the new jobs, you saw a big dip uh, right after, uh, you know, in March 2020, a lot of firms put brakes on their hiring and they, the hiring clearly slowed down. Uh, most metro areas experienced a decline in hiring uh, of about 40%. So a sudden, economically meaningful, very large drop in, in new hires uh, that went, that, 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 that slowed down hiring for, for several months. And then in the last five months, you see a clear pickup, uh, whether it's San Francisco, New York, Boston, Seattle, Houston, Denver. Uh, I, I have the, the 180 largest metro areas in the US. This is clearly a pickup and is accelerating, suggesting that firms are feeling good about uh, the future and they, are, they started hiring again. But the most interesting part is to see the amount of work from home uh, job openings. So these are positions that are advertised as uh, under percent work from home. Uh, so, so they report to a specific office, but the worker can be anywhere uh, he or she wants to be. And what you see is very interesting. Um, in the two years before COVID, uh, you see about, for the typical city, you see that about 2% of the office jobs, white collar positions where under percent work from home. You see a sudden increase uh, with, with in March, 2020. So, so uh, as soon as COVID hit, you see the share tripling. It went from 2% to 6% in the average city uh, with a peak in San Francisco of 9%. And then it stabilized, okay? So yes, work from home, at least the, the share of job, the share of white collar jobs that are under percent work from home, triple in a very short period of time, and you reach a peak. But the peak is still a small share of the overall workforce. We're still talking about six to nine percent. Uh, San Francisco and Austin are the one that have the highest share, and it's nine percent. New York, Chicago, LA, Denver, Houston, Seattle—they're all around six or seven percent. So it remains a small fraction of the overall hiring, uh, despite uh, all the hype and all the prediction, we are the, 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 the share workers who are allowed to work, who, who, whose new jobs are, are 100% remote, it's a trivial, uh, it, you know, it's less than one in 10. Um, I think that the more likely scenario for going forward, it, 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 going forward is one where work from home increases, 
but it remains one or two days a week, uh, not 100%. And if that's the case, then what it means is that um, the link between place of residence and place of work uh, it remains, uh, remains intact. Uh, because if you have to show up at the office three or four days a week, you still have to, you still have to um, leave not too far from where, where, where your office is. It does mean that the footprint, uh, that the, uh, the, 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 the real estate needs of firms might shrink to some extent. Uh, think about it, if, one, if the typical worker is allowed to work from home one day a week, that means that 20% of the workers don't need to be uh, in the office on any given day. If the typical worker is allowed to work from home two days a week, that's 40% fewer workers. Now, I've been talking with developers and it's not clear that you know, the, 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 the demand for, for office space will shrink one-to-one, -one. presumably. Uh, if you have 20% fewer works around, you cannot necessarily shrink the, 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 the footprint by 20, exactly by 20%, it might be a little less. There could be some adjustment there. Um, and that might actually favor uh, areas like where we live uh, instead of her, because it means that cheaper, that, that you, it's probably cheaper for firms to, to locate in a place where land and office are, are, are so expensive. The other aspect that I think it, it could be positive for, for Silicon Valley is that if 20% of the workers are, are, don't, need, don't need to show up uh, in the office every day, that means 20% fewer cars on the freeways and 20% fewer commuters on, on BART. That's, that's a good news for, 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 uh, for congested, success, successful cities like, like San Francisco, Silicon Valley, or, or, or New York. If people can work from home two days a week, that means 40% less traffic and 40% less congestion on, 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 on trains. That's even better news. Um, as I said already a couple of times, I think only times will tell. We, could, we should have uh, the, the same meeting in one year and uh, we'll have much firmer data. But my conclusion is that for the average firm, and I don't mean for all firms, there's certainly exception. I'm, I'm, I'm eager to hear about different experiences uh, from the panelists, but I think for the average firm, uh, I don't, my expectation is that the, the, the new normal in the long run starting in 2022 will be not all that different from, uh, from the past with the possible exception of, of a little bit more flexibility in terms of uh, uh, one or two days of, of, um, of, of remote working. And I'm happy to entertain any questions during the Q&A part. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. Thank you, Enrico. Thank you very much. You really gave us some uh, interesting uh, point of view to, to fuel the discussion next with our panelists. So I would like to invite on the stage uh, Maddalena Dorno. Maddalena is the co-founder and CEO of uh, Dorian Therapeutics, is a biotech startup that is working on uh, aging and uh, she's the main inventor of the Senoblocker technology that the company is pursuing. Maddalena, can you tell just quickly something more about you and your company? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thank you for having me uh, at this event. I'm very excited. I'm also very excited about the Innovation Center that will start here in Silicon Valley. We were really looking forward for something like this. So thank you for all the effort that uh, are required to put that in place. Uh, regarding uh, uh, myself and Dorian Therapeutics, uh, I, uh, again, I'm the CEO of Dorian Therapeutics and my co-founder is also an Italian uh, uh, woman. Benedetta di Robilante, and we met at Stanford a few years ago. And, uh, and from there, we started uh, uh, developing a new way to think about the treatment of aging. So we are developing a, a new approach that we call Senoblocker that can be used across multiple diseases of aging. And we can use this uh, strategy to develop uh, one therapy for uh, osteoarthritis, but also Alzheimer and other uh, related uh, diseases. So the company has been around for three years now. We are uh, eight employees. We are here in the heart of Silicon Valley and uh, we are in preclinical stage. Okay, thank you very much. So it would be interesting to know your, from your point of view, since you're working in the biotech, how do you see the liquid company model uh, where for sure the, the lab presence is, is a requirement? And uh, do you think that the pandemic uh, 
has changed any point of view in that? Yeah, so this here has definitely been interested to, to really understand how the company in the future can work and how mobility can affect all of this. Uh, again, biotech, it's heavily based on R&D and the R&D requires the presence of people in the lab uh, to be executed. It's also true that uh, uh, biotech is not only R&D and there's a lot of other functions that uh, are required for com the company to work from writing project uh, to having patent attorney, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, during the last year, we have been working a lot uh, with the presence all around the world uh, on different projects. And this really changed also the, the productivity related to this project, because if you think about it, uh, 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 Europe it's, uh, it's, uh, has uh, nine hours of uh, time difference uh, with, with uh, here. And so early in the morning, it's the end of the day in, Euro in Europe. And on the other side, uh, Asia, it's at the end of the day, it starts the day when it's the end of the day here. So actually effectively, we have been able to work much faster because we have been able to work with people in different time zones. So virtually, basically around the clock, there has been an, in, an interesting approach to, the, to, to really uh, increase the productivity. I'm, uh, I agree with uh, Enrico Moretti that uh, there's an element of innovation that is not easy to achieve uh, when, uh, when you are uh, far away and uh, when the, the group doesn't meet in person. And uh, regarding this, uh, it's interesting to see that, for example, in biotech, a lot of money has entered in this sector in the past year. But all of these uh, regards company that were already established has been very difficult for new company to emerge. So again, how sustainable is this in the long term? It's something different. But uh, it's interesting also the concept of uh, a, a fluid and a dynamic company don't, not necessarily means always to be remote, but also may, uh, it can mean delocalization of a team. So it could, uh, there, there could be a team in India or a team in Italy. And actually that team can work from there and connect uh, to the headquarters here in Silicon Valley. And this would mean really take the best of both worlds. Again, there's no need to say that the, it, uh, the Italian uh, human capital is amazing uh, in terms of uh, innovation, uh, creativity, and uh, also scientific background. So if we can connect these uh, effectively with the Silicon Valley reality, that uh, would really be uh, make a huge difference. Okay, so it's, but as uh, Enrico said before, uh, only time will tell. So also for you, we will need more time to see what really gonna take step in this, in this thing of the, the, local, the, the localization. Yeah, uh, like a, a try and error is what uh, brings us <laughs> forward. So uh, right now we, we are trying and it's going well. So definitely we will keep doing this. Okay. And, uh, and at the end, uh, uh, it's a, a hybrid model probably is what will win. So still some physical presence, but maybe delocalization and some fluid uh, position. Also, uh, I also hired uh, uh, two people uh, uh, in the last month. And, and again, uh, I would have never thought that I, I could uh, say, you know, you just need to be in the lab two days a week. It's a huge difference compared to, uh, to the past. Okay, okay. Thank you, Madalena. We will get back to you later. That, mm, right now, I want to invite on the stage uh, Giovanni Colella. Giovanni is the co-founder, chairman, and co-CEO of Uda Health, a company that has transformed the administra administrative experience uh, of healthcare. Before Uda, he co-founded several companies uh, in the healthcare sector, leading them to successful exit. So Giovanni, can you also please some, telling, tell us something more about uh, your experience? Yes, uh, um, am I? Yes, I'm not on mute, great. No. Well, thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me. And again, congratulations for putting together a phenomenal panel and uh, for putting together the Innovation Center, which is quite impressive. And all, we're all really, uh, we were in big need of this. Uh, my background is not very, uh, not very interesting to all of you. When you say a serial entrepreneur, you usually say, it's more easy to say unemployable. But by training, I am a physician. I came to America as an immigrant to train in medicine. After that, I started uh, several companies, took a couple of them public. And Uda Health, by the way, of which I'm the co-founder and co-CEO. I'm not, yeah, co-founder and co-CEO and chairman. Uh, as of 
three hours ago doesn't exist anymore because we just successfully sold the company and okay. closed. So congrats. Uh, it was exactly three hours ago. So if you see me a little tired, that's why. <laughs> so um, that's me. That's who I am. And uh, that's what I do. Okay. Thank you, Giovanni. And thanks for inviting me, Luigi. Really honored to be here. Thank you. So um, as a successful entrepreneur with a different exit, um, how would you build a working relationship with Italian talent? And uh, what is missing for you? Mm -hmm. um, well, definitely, uh, let me start by saying that the one thing that is definitely not missing at all is Italian talent. Uh, the depth of talent in Italy, both from a medical standpoint and a technical standpoint, engineering standpoint, is quite impressive. It's humbling for me every time I go back to Italy and I speak to my colleagues to see uh, colleagues. I'm not a doctor anymore. I'm a recovering physician. But the people who trained with me, they're truly impressive. So it is actually saddening sometimes because uh, you see the enormous pool and the asymmetry between supply and demand, right? These guys, super trained, super smart, super good. And a lot of them really underemployed or unemployed. So what is missing? Well, first of all, um, I totally agree with the fact that uh, the tragedy of COVID has brought one thing, which is now we have learned for good and for bad to work much more uh, virtually. We have learned starting even from ourselves in the Valley, right? It was not that common. So will this become the major thing? So I'm really interested to hear in Fabrizio talk because he's successfully done it. Uh, virtually. I'm a little bit more skeptical on the complete virtual model. I'm more in Enrico's camp for now, but first of all, I'm famous for getting all my predictions wrong. Mm -hmm. I was famous for having told my venture capitalists to never invest in that company. It has a name so funny like Google. They will have lost all their money when it was still three, $30 million pre. So they still, right. they still bash me for that. So um, uh, Italy, what's missing is the infrastructure. I mean, I I would love to work with Italy. Deep talent, the deep engineers, deep. I've been back many times trying to structure that. And, and maybe it's just, I just don't get the help I need now. I, I, to be very fair, uh, since uh, we've had Lorenzo in San Francisco, things have improved. But, you know, on our side, I wish we had in Italy a, the possibility of creating a network where People like us can go back and say, look, we want to open up. A, I, I, I went back and I offered to put money to open a center into university or things like that. The bureaucracy killed me. Permission, permits. I mean, just when I have to get a notary, it would cost me five times more, five, 10, 20 times more than what it cost here. At one point, you throw your arms up and you say, look, I just can't do it. I just can't do it. So the system is not geared towards that. For good and for bad, right? I and mean, we I don't want to get into politics here. There's you know the system is much more protective and you have a much more welfare system. There's some really good aspects to it. But as an entrepreneur, every time I go back, I find myself hitting my head against the wall and saying, Wow, I'm like a kid in a candy store here. I have people that are so smart and so eager to work, work really, really hard, and would love to be part of an American adventure, things like that. And then I don't have that infrastructure in place that helps me get that going. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. But do you think that uh, uh, with the pandemic, uh, you will be able to just have some remote workers? Or you think that uh, the problem is also hiring remote people working for you and not only create an infrastructure in Italy? This yeah, location, so the, the answer is I don't know. Okay. But ignorance has never stopped me in the past from expressing an opinion on this, and so I won't stop this time. I think and I hope it will help. I'm starting a new company next week, and I am going back to Italy with something in the range that's not mine, so I can talk about it with my investors, $15 to $20 million to invest in creating a technology center there. It's already there. We have the check. We have everything ready to go so we can actually – let's see how this works. I mean, we have the money, we're ready to go. And I really would love to do it in Italy, not just because I love Italy, but because the talent is there. I don't know, Luigi, we'll see. Okay. Uh, we will really see. I want to hope it seems like the pandemic has helped. It seems that there's a more of an open culture to the virtual 
aspect of what we do. I think that we are now, you know, we're going to get a lot of money from the European Union. So we have to prove that we can put that money to work. And uh, the things I'm going to propose have a strong, um, and, you know, and I want to do it in areas of the country where we can hire easily and give jobs. The proof, as they say here, the proof is in the pudding. Although my little son says, let's say the proof is in the lasagna, which is <laughs> better than the pudding. And I'm like, yeah, I'm proud of you. Even if you, you were born in America, but you have my genes. <laughs> so, okay. so we'll see, Luigi. I just don't know. I would love, to, I mean, I'm really eager to hear Fabrizio because he's been so successful in this and I think we can all learn from that experience. Okay, so, so let's, I, let's, jump, let's jump to Fabrizio. Yeah. So Fabrizio, please come on the stage. Fabrizio is a, a serial entrepreneur and is a, a remote team of veterans, as already Giovanni has told us. And uh, uh, Fabrizio is the chief innovation officer at Minerva Networks. He founded Funambul in 2002, that was a dual model company. Then he founded the Talk TV with the liquid enterprise model with no offices. So uh, Fabrizio, tell us something more about uh, your, a quick recap of your story in the remote team world. Well, thanks Giovanni for, uh, for saying that's successful. I don't know that's uh, <laughs> accurate. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, and uh, just my story is pretty quickly is I started a couple of companies in Italy, and then I moved to Silicon Valley and I worked uh, here for three years to get my green card and start another company. And when I did that, the company is called Funambul. I'm still the president of it. Uh, I decided to build it with the headquarter here and the team in Italy. And that was mainly a reason of talent. The talent I could find here was not as good as the one that I had in my previous companies uh, in Italy, even if I, I was here. And so the idea is American capital, uh, Italian brains. Uh, and that worked really well. Uh, but I had a couple of issues uh, that I noticed while I'm doing it. One is um, we had a headquarter here and they were in Italy, had 100 people in Italy, and they always felt far from us, from far from the decision making, far from the water cooler. They always felt like something was happening and they were just working for us instead of being part of the team. And that bothered me because there were more people there than we had here. The second thing is when I raised Series B, it was I think $18 million, I needed to hire a lot of people in Italy and we had an office in Pavia and hiring a lot of people very quickly in one place in Italy is very hard because Italians don't like to move. They like to stay where, they're, where they live, their mommy is and their food. And so the two things combined made me then decide when we started uh, Talk TV, to try to do a complete liquid company, which meant no office, no, 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 nothing but uh, just people. And that allowed me to hire people in Italy wherever they were. So I hired the first guy in, in Ragusa, Sicily, another one in Sardinia, one in Rome, some in, in, in Milan and so forth. And they all felt close to the headquarters. So I was able to find the best talent where they lived and they were happy to stay there and felt like we were all together. So that's that's my experience for 10 years. So then COVID hit, and then a lot of people are starting to ask me, how did you do for the last 10 years? Yeah, and actually, what have you learned before others on, uh, on, on working remote? So, I mean, you know, everyone now is talking, uh, as we have seen also with Snowflake, uh, that has just made uh, one of the biggest IPO, they went completely remote with no headquarters. And uh, so it's not only for startup anymore. Do you think that uh, the, this distributed model is going to change also like uh, a reduction of cost for the big enterprises since they don't have to, to pay the rent of the offices or this is not the, the real difference? I think there are a couple of things that people don't know uh, yet. And that's because they haven't experienced that. I, I lived through that for 10 years. One that we're humans, we like to touch each other, to smell each other. You can't have people stay remote all the time. We, after years, we just develop a, a, a quarterly cadence to get everybody together in the same room for a week. And that was perfect because we had the combination of creativity when we were all there and a sort of a boost of energy. So we would get together, get excited and execute for three months, and then back. 
And from a cost standpoint, flying people from China, UK, US, Italy in one place for a week was pretty much the cost of a office. So I didn't save any money. I had very high productivity and had very uh, happy people that could work at any time with, where they were uh, with, with the, you know, the, uh, the trees behind their back. So that's the first thing. I think they, they will realize that saving money is not a goal. Uh, it's making sure people are more happy, uh, happier and more productive. The second thing is if they try to do it half away, as with the headquarter, you can live far away. I don't think that will, uh, will actually work. I think that either you go in full in and you're 100% liquid or the half away attempt is probably not going to work. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but for you, the liquid model, the liquid model for sure is something that is going to work. Well, I've seen it. I mean, if I had to do another company, I'll do it exactly like that. I mean, never had as much productivity as uh, people so happy working from, from where they were, whenever they could. We, we were doing sports. They were working at, at night on Sunday. Nobody complained. Everybody's so excited to see each other every three months. I mean, you could dislike the guy ne working next to you. But then if you see them only once every three months, they just friends and you just uh, get mm -hmm. together well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Fabrizio. We'll get back to you later. And uh, I'd like to invite on the stage uh, Marco Zappacosta. And Marco is the co-founder and CEO of uh, Thumbtack. It's an online service that matches customers with uh, local professionals. It's a unicorn after raising more than $400 million from investors. And Marco is planning a major shift in his company and is going to be fully liquid. So, Marco, can you please just give you a quick intro about your story and tell me something more about Thumbtack? Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, so, I think maybe most relevant to this conversation, just a little bit about Thumbtack, the organization. We're 800 people. Um, we <clears throat> were headquartered in San Francisco, where we had sort of all of product development. And then we had an office in Salt Lake City, where sales and, and success was, <clears throat> as well as an office in Toronto, the start of a new development hub, as well as uh, another site in the Philippines in Manila. Um, and I will admit that I was very skeptical of remote only cultures. And, and in fact, Thumbtack historically had a very office centric culture. Um, you know, we actually, you know, made food, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner most days for everybody and brought people together and, and made a lot of that as a driver of who we were and how we worked. Uh, and so I was naturally skeptical of this experiment, but I'll tell you, you know, 15 months later, I've become convinced that uh, the most productive firms, and I'm referring to companies that are, call it at least a hundred people. Uh, I think the equilibrium point for very small companies will likely be different, but for sort of like medium sized companies and beyond, um, I've really come to believe that a virtual centric sort of teamwork model, um, and I really say teamwork because I think that's the core change here, that the sort of group workspace moves from a physical place to a digital place. Um, I believe that the most productive, efficient, effective uh, knowledge-based companies um, in the future will be virtual centric. Um, and, you know, that's the bet that we've now made and, and committed to. And, and I'm happy to spend time talking about sort of what we see in this future. Um, I'll say it, it does not, to me, mean all virtual. I think there'll be a big component um, of in-person coming together. I think there's certain things that you just can't replace. Um, but um, it's a, a transition that I'm excited to take on because I think it ultimately enable us to be the best version of ourselves. Okay. But... Um... Speaking about this, uh, you know, the Silicon Valley has always been known for, his, uh, for its people culture. How can you ensure the same level, level of talent acquisition and retention and when people are geographically dispersed? So obviously you have to choose what things to keep fixed and what things to flex on. Um, I think what uh, remote work sort of... Uh, precipitates um, is a much more explicitly defined culture, a much more explicitly defined norms and operating procedures. And through that, a culture that is sort of more efficient and productive. And I think that's something to lean into that sort of um, that clarity, but at the same time, uh, recognizing that 
there need to be moments for creating cohesion. And so whether it's onboarding a quarterly meetup, uh, annual sort of event, um, you need to sort of balance both. Okay, okay. Thank you, Marco. Uh, we will get back to you. Let me see, we have, I think, uh, a couple of questions already coming. And please, if you have every other question after the panel, let me see. So there is a question for Enrico. So Enrico, if you please can come on the stage. And uh, so I just read the, the question. What exactly are we, are we losing when working online? And how can we get an estimate for that? Is, is it that workers shirk more when they are not monitored? Is it lack of serendipious ideas, speed of decision making? Um, I don't think it's the monitoring um, per se. I, th I think the monitoring is overrated. I, I, I think a lot of you know, people want to shirk that people can shirk in the office as much as, uh, as at home. Uh, I think that um, we, are, we are losing um, certainly the, 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 the creation of new ideas from certain deputies' contests. The water, water cooler uh, effect, as Giovanni was. Uh, was mentioned. Uh, I can clearly see it in my work. Uh, I, I, I'm craving to go back uh, and to talk with colleagues. It's very hard for me to schedule a Zoom call with a colleague to have the great next, you know, the next great idea. <laughs> it's much easier for me to schedule a Zoom call with a colleague and say, let's finish an existing project that started before. Uh, um, and so I, I think there is, there is some of that, and I, I don't think it's just, and I think it's widely felt in academia, but I think it extends to, to, to the private sector as well. In, in, in regarding to Fabrizio's and Marco's experience, I think, um, you know, the answer is probably not, I don't think we should, it, it, there's not like one answer that applies to all sectors and all firms. The answer probably, vastly depend on what we are making, uh, what sectors we are with exactly what technology we're in and what, what, what type of product, what type of services we, we, we are selling. Um, the, the data that I was referring to were from a survey of uh, top managers and CEOs uh, that were surveyed um, at different point uh, of the pandemic. It was just an average across many, many, many different sectors. I think the Fabrizio's and Marco's experience are perfectly consistent with the, with the survey. They, they, I, they, there are certainly niches for, 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 for different models. But I think on average, uh, for the typical uh, workplace, I, I think uh, um, being in the office as tang tangible advantage. The other, the other two advantages are being close to clients. Uh, a lot of people in, uh, in the innovation sector report that the best ideas come from uh, interacting with the clients, understanding exactly what they need face-to-face. Uh, -face. Um, and also, I think, I mean, the issue of the onboarding for me is is, is also very important. I, it, it's, it's great to hear that Marco and Fabrizio were able to, to address it. Um, my guess is that not, not all the firms are able to onboard people remotely and get those new colleagues uh, be part of the team uh, on Zoom, just the same, in the, to the same degree that, that it was physical, it, it, was, it was possible in, you know, when we're meeting physically. Okay, um, uh, Enrico, we have uh, just another question for you from Marco Venturini. Uh, how did you measure the decline of innovation that you said that you started to observe after COVID hit? Uh, that was, just, uh, again, was from a survey of top managers and CEOs. Uh, of, uh, I've been advising, this, this, I've been advising a, a, a large real estate investment company that has office space and expensive cities and it's kind of panicking now. Uh, and so they, they did the surveys and I've been, I've been working with them trying to assess what they can expect for, you know, going forward. Their point of view is, is office demand for office space, uh, which is 
one to one related to the topics that we've been discussing. Because obviously, every time Marco, every time Fabrizio hires somebody in the Philippines or in Italy, well, that's one less square foot of, or one less less square footage that is in demand here. And so they are, and their investors are panicking because they they, they are they are um, they're concerned about about what the future might look like in you know in places like San Francisco, New York, and Boston. And I I've been generally giving them some some optimism. Okay, so I see that we don't have any other questions. So in the meantime, uh, I will go on with. Uh, oh, actually, wait, Emilia. Let me take the question of Emilia Aliotto. So uh, Fabrizio said something very interesting about co-workers relationships, which which makes me think of another very positive aspect of working remotely: less cases of mobbing. What do you think? Is that for me? Yeah, I, mean, for I, think, I think Marco has a much bigger company. He can answer that <laughs> much better. For me, it's, you know, let's I see. always had small companies, so I don't think we had that issue uh, anymore. Okay, so let's get to Marco. Of, of sort of grouping within it? Sorry, I didn't catch the... No, the, the question, question is, uh, okay, so uh, another very positive aspect of working remotely, so since you don't have to be full-time altogether, is less cases of mobbing. Do you think uh, this is something that is going to be an impact, uh, for example, in your company that you have uh, nearly a thousand employee or uh, it's something that is not? And mobbing um, is just sort of, uh, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know what that is. Oh, <laughs> the mobbing is like when uh, you, how can we say it? It's when you don't behave well uh, or you try to be, Got it. okay. So uh, my hypothesis about virtual work is it's fundamentally more equitable. Um, I think there is a much more inherent power dynamic in physical space that you very quickly achieve once you get to a business of a certain size, uh, what the office layout, who sits next to who, who's in the room, who's not in the room, who's in the main office, versus the satellite office in down the street or in a different city. Uh, that, is, that is today true of most companies of any size. And I think what's very notable about remote work is it breaks all of that. It takes it all away. And we're just in these all the same little box. And it's a, a, a very equalizing experience. And I think through that, there's an opportunity, I think, to create a fundamentally more Uh, equitable experience where people are able to more fully participate um, in the success of the business and in their own work uh, because the work operates through a digital medium rather than an in-person medium. Um, now that, that I think what, um, you know, the professor said, which is obviously true is there's a broad spectrum of companies and industries and products. So this is not one equilibrium point, but I really do believe for knowledge work fairly broadly that the equilibrium point will shift to a significantly more virtually centric model, primarily because it's more efficient and through that more productive, but also because I think the employee experience can be better. Um, and I think that will ultimately attract the very best talent. Um, that's a hypothesis. That's a, a bet that we are taking, um, but it's what I think the frontier will look like. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now Maurizio is asking uh, uh, how to manage a company culture. So it's usually achieved by just being around and uh, symbiotically absorb the how, what is going on, on over time. In a liquid company, the quarterly annual get together help with establishing a kind of relationship, but time is limited. Oh. Is not written well. Okay, but I mean, and then all people are gone. What specific actionable task to establish and propagate the culture you want as company leader? So I will try to go to Giovanni if he wants to take this question. Sure. Yeah, and I, and again, I'm probably the one that is most skeptical about the scalability over time of the totally virtual model. So although um you, you know marco is the one that has closest the biggest number of employees but 
for example, both Rita and Castlight, we, we have passed the 1,500 employees. And so the culture in the offices, which I happen to know because I know a little bit about Marco's company, it's an incredibly strong culture that Marco's created. So I'm totally respectful of the way he's approaching it. But the culture in the office, in my opinion, is very tribal for good and for bad. And the presence of the founders next to other people, somebody said, you know, we like to touch, we like to talk. Yes, that's totally true. It's not just because we're Italians. We just like the tribal presence of being close to each other, right? I'm famous for being a hugger. Not everybody does that. And now with vaccines, I'm so happy it's back. But Marco, I'm a little afraid. So you raise some really good issues. I make no mistakes. And at the end of the day, you're an N of one, I'm an N of one, and time will tell both of us where we're heading. And it probably will be a, a mix of both things with the good and bad that come from it. But I believe that unless people like us, who are the guys who start the company, right? I always say behind any business, uh, there's an act of courage. We have the courage to do that. And it's our culture that comes there. It's the people are going to look to us. We're walking power. And if we're on Zoom, I don't feel I can convey that in the right way. And scaling, for example, then I'll stop here because you know, I'm a big talker. But for example, onboarding new people. It's difficult on Zoom, right? I mean, I, I love to spend hours with the new employees. We have all these meetings, we talk, we share experiences. On Zoom is very, di very different. Although I'll admit, and I really will stop at this point, Marco, you've said something that touched me because I, I didn't think of it that way. It is an equalizer under certain dimensions because you do crush the informal piece of, you know, I'm sitting next to the CEO. And, uh, and no matter what, no matter how much we want to be politically correct and all that kind of stuff that exists. That's a, that's a fact, right? And so, Marco, that's it. You got me on that one. Uh, I need to <laughs> reflect on. It. I never thought about that, and it, there's something really true about that. Giovanni, I want to add one thing that that is my experience. I I could not have done Funambul with a Skype because it was impossible to communicate with the employees, and I could not have done Talk TV without Slack. So to me, what you're talking about is luck. For me, my home was luck. My office was luck. And we were all there the C next to the CEO. Everybody was so close to me because they, everybody in a public forum could write to me. And when you have to write, you have to think a little bit more. So usually you have one level before you, you press, you say, let me think if I'm, because people do reply all and they, they learn that that's not a good idea. That's a reply all that everyone in the company sees. So Conversations are more polite. People think a little bit more and they're all in, in the same room. So culture building for me, and I did it for four companies, was a lot easier, was a lot easier at Talk TV because it was in writing. And plus this week where we were all together, where we could actually experience and phone calls and Zoom calls, we would do once or twice a week. But the being in the same room, everyone in the same room at the same time, rather than me one on one, I think that built the culture that really worked for us for 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 ten years. Yeah, no, it, look, it's very fair for me. That's a good point. Even there, I now the, the more I listen, and the more you know, I'm I'm sort of you're, you're you're getting to me because Slack has changed things. I'm seeing even the company that acquired us now that is much bigger. They they did one team Slack right away. It's Beautiful. Everybody's talking and welcoming us and things like that. That's pretty cool. That's pretty good. Now I'm I'm being kicked out, right? Nobody wants to keep the CEO, but I love to see the teams interacting like that. So it, it's a fair point. The technology is now and Zoom is much much better. You know, it's uh, and now they're putting the makeup on Zoom too, so even people that are my age can look good. It's so cool. I love that. In person, I can't I can't deny. Nobody knows that I'm short and. Uh, and an old on Zoom. So you, you will have help also from the Madalena yeah, aging Madalena. company. But Madalena, I want to turn just the discussion a little more on the on the on the Italy side, just to also understand in this panel how we can uh, oh what can happen for Italy and what are the opportunities for Italy. We have already talked sometimes about 
a biohub in your case. So what do you think are the opportunities for that? Yeah, again, uh, uh, the, the good thing about one of the many good thing about Italy is that really from a scientific and technological point of view, things are really advanced. So working with Italy in a co collaboration model would make a lot of sense. For, for a startup, uh, again, uh, the presence here in Silicon Valley at the moment matters a lot when it comes to talking to investors and uh, uh, developing ideas. But uh, having a biohub in Italy to actually uh, develop a part of the R&D would really bring uh, together the best of both worlds. Like uh, I could easily imagine uh, that 30 or 40 percent of the R&D activity of Dorian, for example, could be done uh, in, uh, in Italy easily. And this would mean from one side that the, the, co the, the cost of R&D in Italy is lower, but also you can have a distributed team with the, where you choose the expertise that like uh, sectors that where Italy is very strong uh, could, be, could uh, really help uh, projects uh, uh, moving uh, forward in an efficient way. Again, uh, uh, there was a, a question before uh, from Juliana uh, related to uh, labor laws and also like yeah. how how the entire ecosystem, when it comes to the bureaucracy, how, how does it display in all of this? For example, in a company, like, uh, in a biotech company, there's a huge advantage in terms of uh, R&D tax credit. So, and this tax credit uh, actually applies only if you do the R&D in US. So there are systems in place to discourage to move part of the activity abroad. This is not uh, completely uh, like this does uh, 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 people still work with the uh, outside of US to develop R&D. Again, uh, the cost may be lower, but again, making the bureaucracy more st simple and straightforward to facilitate a collaboration like this would mean a lot. Okay. And maybe, the, maybe if I can add on, on the legal yeah, side. I had, a, I had a, a headquarter here and I had a subsidiary in Italy, which was fully owned by the U.S. corporation, which is the model I used also for Funambo, and all the employees in Italy were hired by the Italian company as full-time employees. So it was clean. The only issue in Italy was when I went to talk to them, said, okay, they're working from home. And they said, what do you mean you're working from home? Where's the office? Oh, my office is your office. You are my commercialista, and we're going to be in your office, but no one will ever show up. And I'm going to give everybody an unlimited number of vacation days and says, how do we do that? So we had to work a little bit, you know, kind of through the system in Italy, which wasn't flexible. I think with COVID, it should be a lot easier now that it was 10 years ago, but it, it is doable. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, I want to ask Marco if uh, I, probably you don't, you don't have any remote employee, remote team in Italy right now, or you have also someone in Italy? We do not, no. Okay, so do you think, uh, or do you see opportunities for Italy to profit from this distributed model coming, becoming more common? Or what can Italy for you do to, to try to involve more uh, Silicon Valley company to, to, to profit from all the, tech, you know, the technical people we have? Yeah, I, I imagine it would be a more powerful vector for European companies than I think American technology companies. And the reason I say that is uh, time zones still matter. Um, just because we're working virtually doesn't mean that there isn't synchronous work. Um, and to do synchronous work efficiently, you have to overlap your workday. And so I think even in the US, a spread of three hours um, kind of maxes us out right now in, in wanting to create a unified workday. And we have the Philippines, which pulls, pulls one direction. So Europe kind of pulls the other. So I think uh, I, I say that for us, because I want to highlight that virtual work doesn't sort of remove the reality of geography. Obviously, it still exists. Um, it just sort of changes how you can refactor the organization in service of being more effective. But I think for us, <clears throat> it, probably, it probably wouldn't um, enable us to hire in Europe yet, but one day, um, and that's that's sort of my preference because I want to protect time for us to work together as groups, um, as teams, and I, I uh, you need to be in the same time zone. So I think we're more likely to go south, to go to South America, um, but that's more of a time zone driven decision than a, um, that's the best talent market in the world decision. Okay, thank you, Marco. And, um... 
Mm, Giovanni, I want to ask you also like how do you bring how we can bring back opportunities to Italy? Yeah, given the pandemic. I, one thing I didn't I didn't mention before that I found when I one point I tried to even start a company in Italy uh, and uh, through my American company. There is also a mentality issue, a cultural issue, right? So working for a startup sounds exciting until you start telling the average Italian that salary is going to be quite low and uh, there's huge risk involved. Uh, failure in Italy is still seen as something that you are going to pay for life, while here in Silicon Valley, for us, sometimes it's a badge of honor. Um, And the stock option and understanding of the equity upside is, is not as sophisticated as it is here. So that's created that I really had a hard time recruiting, right? Especially at the senior level, because they're used to big salaries. And I remember people telling me, well, I get a free car here. I'm like, well, you know, that's not really free if you actually understand the economics of it, but it wasn't, it wasn't the mentality wasn't there. What can we do? Well, start changing that. And uh, my understanding is, for example, that Draghi is really working hard in that direction, that we have a new, what is it called? I think Minister of Technology and, and somebody who's a manager. Extre- I don't know him. I had never had the honor of, when I left this, I'm, I'm just a poor immigrant trying to make a living. I don't know anybody when I go back. Uh, but uh, the my understanding is we have some very sophisticated people now that are managing um, uh, the innovation part of Italy. So that changing mentality and bringing the right incentives in place will help a lot, will quite help a lot there. The second thing is, and then again, I'll stop here, is let's just force ourselves, all of us. I mean, we all love Italy here. I think, I hope, uh, how can you not love Italy? And uh, we... We're blessed. We were blessed to be able to come here as immigrants and do fairly well. Let's really force ourselves to bring opportunities back and offer them, right? So I made it clear in my new investors that these $20 million will be earmarked to invest in Italy, for, obviously not for charity because no venture capitalist is Mother Teresa, but they believe we can really create technology centers there. So if we can put these chemistries together, I am. I'm an eternal optimist. I really do believe that this may be the perfect storm now. It may be the right moment to get things started. And the amount of talent, Marco, I can guarantee you, you can go south, but the talent you're going to find in Italy, it's remarkable. The food is great and the people are fun. <laughs> that's true in the south too, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Giovanni. And uh, Fabrizio, uh, I want to ask you like nearly the same question. So what uh, we can do on what would you do to bring back opportunities to Italy and to connect more again, like before Italy with Silicon Valley and get the, the best of both worlds? Well, I've, I've you know, tried uh, pretty much all my life to bring the two together. And uh, I'm still convinced that if you want to build a company that scales, I mean, I'm, I'm in software. So I've, everything I've said since the, uh, the beginning of the panel is about software. If you have a lab, it's a different story. If you have hardware, it's a different story. But the beauty of software, which I'm fairly convinced is going to run uh, you know, the, the planet moving forward, uh, is that you don't have to move people anymore. You can develop software. You can be a designer for wherever you are. So this is, I'm from Valtellina, which is a small valley in the Alps, where I had to move away from to become an engineer. Uh, you really have the chance now to create a company that scales worldwide from, you know, a valley in the Alps. Uh, you just need an internet connection. So uh, you can move stuff out. One of the issues of my valley is that it's hard to get in. It's an island. It's gr- great. But then you need uh, two hour and a half hours to get in. So anything you build there to ship it, it takes time. While software goes like that. So I think this is a unique, incredible opportunity for the country because he has the talent that doesn't want to move, which is a limitation, but at this point is not a limitation anymore, to use that talent to create companies that can scale worldwide from wherever uh, they live. And I think this is, this if they, if they take it, uh, we take it, because I'm planning to go back to Italy soon after 22 years here. Uh, if we take it well, I think this next three years could be the one that actually turned the country around. 
Okay, thank you, Fabrizio. Okay, so let me see the time, uh, 6.30, okay. Fabrizio, let me know when you go back. I really want to start something with you while you're there. <laughs> so you see, the panel already means <laughs> something good. That's a, that's a deal, actually, you're here. <laughs> <laughs> and we're both Buddhists, so how many <laughs> how Italians do you know? <laughs> okay, so uh, first of all, I want to check if there is any other questions or we answer to everyone. Let me see. Okay, it seems that we are okay. So I want to thank uh, Maddalena, Giovanni, Fabrizio, Marco, and Enrico for uh, being with us here and help us understand better what will happen next and how we can try to profit from this situation both for Italy and for Silicon Valley. And uh, lastly, I want to invite uh, on the stage uh, uh, Alessandro Ratti from ISNAF to make some uh, closing remarks uh, and to close the event. Please, Alessandro. Okay, yes, uh, I'm Alessandro. my name is Alessandro Ratti. I'm a co-chair of the Bay Area chapter of ISNAF and I joined Luigi in thanking uh, the five speakers for their contributions. I also thoroughly enjoy the somewhat different opinions that are that always make debates uh, much healthier. Uh, I want to thank Luigi that kept the debate on track like a Swiss watch, uh, destroying the reputation of Italians being bad organizers. So thank you for uh, for doing such a nice job. Uh, time to thank uh, uh, the committees uh, for their support and all the volunteers of ISNAF that work behind the scenes to make this happen. And we'll continue doing that. We are going to publish this uh, video with Italian subtitles soon so that uh, Italians can enjoy that and hopefully get messages and, and useful input from it. Um, I certainly want to not miss the opportunity to uh, thank our Consul General Lorenzo Ortona, who uh, is soon to leave. And I couldn't imagine a better farewell for, from him than the launch of the Innovation Center. As a lot of people mentioned, this Innovation Center in San Francisco is going to be a, a very important hub for many of us. Lorenzo has been a driving force for a lot of Italian activities and a tremendous supporter of business. We all look forward to reading the news on uh, future successes that we'll certainly have in his next activities and hope that our paths will cross again. And lastly, uh, and tying to what, uh, what um, Alberto said earlier, I uh, want to thank the audience for the very good questions and the involvement that, that you had. And uh, always remember, remind that you can always get involved with our activities, contribute don by donating time or money or ideas, reach out to us if, if anything. And uh, in closing, I look forward to seeing everybody, hopefully in person at the next event as we will be allowed to start having real activities in real venues. And normally this is a time when in our events we can smell the, 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 the taste and flavor of pizza getting ready the, by our host uh, in, in an actual restaurant. So thank you again and uh, look forward to the next event and to seeing you all in person soon.